Past tense, right? And present tense, too much, right, Judy? Too much. And when we confess to one another, then we go, oh, those are little things. Oh, no, they're not little things. And here they are speaking to the Jews about God and how much he loves them and how he's triumphed over our sin and rebellion with Jesus and the sacrifice that Jesus has given. So it just simply states fact. God raised him from the dead. That's big stuff. That's big. To raise Jesus from the dead. And they offer this evidence. Those who traveled with him, they saw him. Many days, they saw him up and going again. And Paul applies the truth of the resurrection to what he's saying right here. Simply, this type of resurrection shows he's the son of God. God's got a lot of sons. But according to John 3.16, he's the unique one. Paul quoted from the Psalms. Psalms 2 and verse 7. I will tell of the decree of the Lord. He said to me, you are my son today. I have begotten you. So Leon, amen me when I say he's got many sons, he's got many daughters. Praise God for that. This unique relationship to Jesus because Jesus gave so much and Jesus is the Savior that we had to have. Jesus is the Savior that we need. And the resurrection proves he was totally holy. Even in that work on the cross. Totally giving himself to the Father. The 16th Psalm in verse 10. For you will not abandon my soul to the grave. You will not allow your Holy One to undergo decay. Paul wants them to have confidence in what he's saying. So he doesn't just get up and say, I think, or this is what God has called me to tell you. He takes the Holy Scripture and he says, look at how Jesus fulfills this. And when he does that, he them the ability to stand on the foundation of what they know. And the belief starts to come into their minds and hearts and lives saying, this Jesus is the Messiah. Have you heard much about Jewish Messiahs? There's a bunch of them. And it seems like every generation they're saying, this, this one could be the Messiah. So these people, they may have heard this kind of stuff before. But Paul's presenting the proofs that the Word says about Jesus and our eyewitness testimony to his resurrection about Jesus. And these seeds of hope start to bloom in their hearts start to sprout and then grow and bloom. I think it would start with, well, he could be. And then by the time they get down to the end of their teaching, you got this half and half situation with some of them saying, I know he is. And the others saying, let's kill him. And Satan is active and he doesn't do anything by half either. Let's, let's kill him. Not let's hurt them. Let's kill them. Verse 38 and following. Brothers, listen. He wants their attention. Listen, this is important. We are here to proclaim that through this man, Jesus, there is forgiveness for your sins. Everyone who believes in him is made right in God's sight. Something the law of Moses could never do. Be careful. Don't let the prophet's words apply to you. For they said, look, you mockers, be amazed and die. For I'm doing something in your own day, something you wouldn't believe, even if someone told you about it. As Paul and Barnabas left the synagogue that day, the people begged them to speak about these things again the next week. 
and many Jews and devout converts to Judaism followed Paul and Barnabas, and the two men urged them to continue to rely on the grace of God. They didn't say rely on what we're telling you. They didn't say rely on us. They said, we've got to keep our foundation, our trust, our reliance in the Father. Trust Him in this. And follow Paul and Barnabas. It's really good. Talking with a brother yesterday, my physical brother, who is a preacher for the Church of Christ in North Platte, Nebraska. And it's a long way from here. But he's doing what he's supposed to do and is, and is happy there. And he's been to this church for 20 years. Out there, he's, he's encouraged me. I said, I just can't wait for tomorrow morning to be here. I said, I need to see my church family. I need to fellowship with my church family. We come together on Sunday mornings. We sing. We shake hands. We smile at each other and say kind words. We might even have lunch together. People. <laughs> All right, Pete, I go. That's a good one. And then we go our separate ways. But Paul and Barnabas, they, they spoke and they went their separate way. And there's a good number of these people that hadn't heard this kind of talk before. And they said, where are you going? We're going. They were hoping to hear some more of these words about Jesus. And I don't think Paul and Barnabas wanted to shake them off. Through this man is preached to you the forgiveness of sins. The promise that because of Jesus and who he is and what he's done brings forgiveness to those of us that freely trust in him. Jesus. Yeah. Yes. So, uh, there's some people that have a cross on their lapel. There's other people that have that on their chain. Judy's walking around, she got a frog on her lapel. And we're saying, what? And she gives us that little acronym right there. That's very good, Judy. Thank you. Fully rely on God. They talk about justification when they're preaching this. Fully justified from all the things that we did that weren't the right things. Well, Moses couldn't do it. And he warns them in verse 40. Beware. If we don't embrace the person of Jesus Christ, if we don't look to him and, and seek to be his disciples, if we're despisers of Jesus, our lives are going to perish. We've got to come to the point of understanding real discipleship. A disciple was one that came and learned from the teacher. So when the teacher's gone, his word carries on through that student, that disciple. The light is continued to be shined through that disciple. So we, in churches of Christ, we have a house full of teachers. We don't have to wait and rely on just what's the preacher going to preach or what's one of the elders going to get up and teach in Bible class, something like that. We all have our own Bibles, and we all see ourselves wanting to know more about what he's saying to us because it's, like Paul said in 1 Corinthians 7, it's treasure in earthen vessels that we have share with other folks. And so these two earthen vessels right here, Paul and Barnabas, they're in Iconium. They, they want to teach. They want people to know. Well, they're coming to Iconium. I've already prepared for 14. I'm a little bit ahead of myself. And he's just pleading with them to follow. Some of the commentators I read while I was uh, preparing this lesson wanted to complain a little bit that uh, 
Paul sounds too much like Peter back in Acts chapter 2 right here. All I've got to say is what is there to complain about if Paul's preaching sounds like Peter? Could they be preaching the same gospel about the same Savior? Absolutely. Then others were saying he sounds a whole lot like Stephen in Acts chapter 7 when he's talking to the Jews and rehearsing their history. Well, he was there. Seems like I remember the picture being painted in the scripture of him standing there with coats. Just throw them down right here. I'll watch them while you go stone this zealot. So what if God wants to use that in that way? That was a sermon that Paul heard when he still hated Jesus. And if he has preached this, if Barnabas has brought his encouragement right there, and half of them believed and half of them didn't, you can bet their hearts are still going out to the half that didn't believe yet. Maybe as Paul spoke to these folks, the words of the first mar martyr still ringing in his ears. And he wants to do what he can do to repent of that sin. Verse 44, the next Sabbath day. Almost everyone in town came to hear the message about the Lord. And when the Jewish people saw the crowds, they were very jealous. They insulted Paul. They spoke against everything he said. Both Paul and Barnabas replied courageously. It was necessary to speak the word of God to you first. Since you reject it, and you do not consider yourselves worthy of eternal life, we are turning to the Gentiles. I don't know about you. There's sometimes people can talk to you, and they are very effective in being so precise and so bold and so strong that you just feel like you've been slapped in the face. I think Paul's got that kind of intensity right here. And it's... There's nothing like a, a slap to the face to wake you up, you know? If you're just kind of floating along. And Paul has woken them up with these words that he's saying to them. Since you don't consider yourselves worthy of eternal life. That's enough to make you draw a deep breath in. <laughs> Do they want to live... I'm convinced just as sure as we want to live, they want to live before the Lord, before God. Since you don't consider yourselves worthy, we're turning to the Gentiles. Wow. Verse 47, for this is what the Lord has commanded us. I have appointed you to be a light for the Gentiles, to bring salvation to the ends of the earth. When the Gentiles heard this, they began rejoicing. They began glorifying the word of the Lord. And all who had been appointed to eternal life believed. And the word of the Lord was being spread through the whole region. Picture it. The next Sabbath day comes up. The text says the whole city's there. The whole city's not there. I'm not arguing with inspired word here. I'm just interpreting what's here. There's still some people at home hoeing in the garden. There's still some men at home fussing at their wives. There's still some people at home just doing the work that they're doing. But this big, large amount of people come out because they want to hear. Brother, I was working with the Sycamore Church. It was in 1995. We went to, a, a group of us went to Russia. We went to Moscow. We went to a place called Clean, K-L-I-N. And if you've heard me tell this story before, please forgive me, but it just touches me. We went to preach the gospel in this city of 400,000 people. We went to the civic auditorium. We had that reserved. It was a huge building. And the, the auditorium was circular-like, and there's, there's double doors all around it. And the people just kept coming and kept coming. And it filled up and it filled up. There wasn't room for a seat. And finally, the officials that were running the building came and locked the doors. 
We Americans were standing back there together. So like this, don't call the fire marshal. They may have not had a fire marshal. They couldn't let anybody else in. They had four television stations in this city. And they were all there with their cameras set up. That wasn't the days that you put them on your shoulder and just walked around and followed them. They had them on their stands. They're up there. They're, they're zooming in on the preaching. I wasn't preaching that night. We had a better preacher than me. And these people, these Russians, they're just hungry. Because what we've been doing had been, it's just been teaching that Jesus came, lived, and died for you. That you don't have to be lost. And these people who had lived up in a godless society who really felt hopeless just couldn't believe this good news. The Lord works. He's still working. You know, I just can't imagine them sending television people from Knoxville down here to put everything we're saying on television. These people were so hungry for it. Even the ones that you would expect not to be, the television producers. Oh, we gotta get we gotta get the cameras over there. I believe this message that Paul and Barnabas are carrying is striking the same kind of chord with these people. You may God would care for us enough that he sends the Messiah in this generation and he died for us. They're in shock and their response is great. They rejoice, verse 48. They glorify God. And then verse 49. The word of God spreads. Of course. I use this illustration way too often. If somebody tells me the gasoline in Food City is going up for 10 cents a gallon, I'm going to call you. I mean, I may be standing at the pump filling up my tank, but I'm going to call you and share that good news. They've got such good news. The world spreads because they're not keeping it to themselves. They're even telling their neighbors that they don't really like. Don't you have a few like that? I mean, you got the ones you love, but you've got some that you kind of have to live with because your house is here and your house is there and you cross paths every now and then. Okay. God loves those people too. Did you know that? Boy, I have to be godlike and learn to do that. The Gentiles, when they heard this, the text says they were glad. They glorified the word of the Lord. As many as had been appointed to eternal life believed. God knows hearts. And when God knows that your heart is one that is tender, He sends the word your way, give you that chance to rejoice and accept and follow and tell your neighbors. Oh. This is fulfillment of prophecy. Look back at Isaiah 49, verse 6. The Almighty says, Is it too insignificant a task for you to be my servant to reestablish the tribes of Jacob and restore the remnant of Israel? I will make you a light to the nations so you can bring my deliverance to the remote regions of the earth. Prophecies, they have more than one interpretation sometimes, meaning for one generation and another for another generation. This one right here is looking forward to Jesus coming and restoring God's people and then opening the door to the rest of God's people, us Gentiles. And so our Gentile brothers and sisters of that earlier generation respond enthusiastically. And Paul shows his wisdom in not trying to spend all his time persuading hard hearts. If your heart's going to be hard, I'm going to nail you and name you as a hard-hearted person, and I'm going to find some fertile ground. 
but in God's leading, Paul's approach to doing that is one of those bucket of cold water things. I hope it wakes you up. I hope you would, as you ponder this, consider yourself worthy. What in the generation do you live in? What are the people from the planet? What are we like as Americans? What about anything that spoils my greedy little soul? You like me too much, forgive me. We like to play too much and rest too much and think not enough of other people. Americans have been taught that we are number one. Number one. He's number one. And the disciples have the right kind of pattern for us. They gave themselves for him. They did. And we can do that. It is, this is one of the nicest places to live that I've ever encountered. Lisa and I, we drive, we say, I can't believe we're here. We never thought we'd live in a place like this. It's a great place. We can, we can enjoy this place. It's beautiful. You can relax here. But you look around and there's so many people here that don't know God. Some of the most interesting and satisfying things we can do is just talk about Jesus. You don't have to be a preacher to talk about his love. And if I'm convinced there are people that have the same kind of hunger for him that God has placed within them, they're just waiting for that word that you might say. And instead of belittling you, yeah, I don't want to mislead you. You'll be belittled some of the time. But for those hungry-hearted people, they won't belittle you. They'll listen to you. And they'll be like those people following Paul and Barnabas after that first Sabbath's preaching because they want to know what you're talking about. And they want what you have because they need that for themselves too. Judy, if you've got another thought. Yeah, we still have those individuals who like to turn on the radio and listen to the people. Amen. I mean, I can That's going to be our hope. Thank you, sister. It makes us uncomfortable when somebody calls your name out in a Bible class. But yes, you're right. As uncomfortable as it makes me. And I could start telling stories about all of us in here like that in some way. Amen. Amen. God is a giver of talents. And we take what he gives us. And will we use it for his glory? Amen. Before I run on with the next scripture, any other thoughts? No. All right, co teacher. <laughs> Verse 50 and following. Then the Jews stirred up the influential religious women and the leaders of the city, and they incited a mob against Paul and Barnabas and ran them out of town. So they shook the dust from their feet as a sign of rejection, and they went to the town of Iconium. And the believers were filled with joy and filled with the Holy Spirit. Shook the dust off their feet. A declaration of, I don't even want dust from your city 
the way you're acting to go with me. You're rejecting God. This is a serious thing. And so they do that, they move along. If Jewish people, when they were traveling, had to go through a Gentile city, they'd shake the dust off the feet when they left the edge of the city. It was kind of saying to God, keep me pure, help me not be led by their ways, the things that I may have seen while I've been in the city, the thoughts I could have, the temptations I could have. And Paul is echoing that right here. The rejection, I don't believe, made Paul, was because Paul and Barnabas thought there was something wrong with what they had done and what they had said. They knew the problem was in the opposition that was coming to them. Because this God commission message they're, they're sharing, there's nothing wrong with that. And so the text says in verse 51, they go to Iconium. There's sometimes, if we're rejected, it makes us want to give up. We, he went back to the prophets. And the prophet verse all the prophets of Baal and the challenge there let's, let's give sacrifices to our gods and Elijah he, he gets the sacrifice ready and they jump around they cut themselves they scream they cry because the deal they have is we're not going to light sacrifices if our gods are real they light them themselves and God sends them flame and consumes that sacrifice that's laid out there for him. And the people that are watching are all stirred up and they listen about our God. And when you look and a couple chapters later in this Old Testament story, he's all worn out and he's tired and he's hiding in a cave. There's sometimes God can do great things. We see him ourselves. And we, because of our humanity and our own weakness, we get tired. We gotta, we gotta look at these things. We've got to remember these things. Because God is faithful. And we have a light to shine. Even when we get tired. Anything else you want to bring out of these scriptures? No. <coughs> All right, that's chapter 13. <coughs> I think I've got nine minutes left. Those are two many precious minutes. I'm going to do a little bit more, Pete. All right, chapter 14. First two verses. At Iconium, Paul and Barnabas went to went as usual into the Jewish synagogues. And there they spoke so effectively that a great number of Jews and Greeks believed. But the Jews who refused to believe stirred up the other Gentiles and poisoned their minds against the brothers. I read those verses and I think, haven't we seen this before? Isn't this another verse the same kind of song because they've got a pattern first we go to synagogues first we go to God's people first we speak to God's people about the Messiah coming they do that and a great number of Jews believe verse 1 says a great number of Greeks also believe that's good Iconium was a very Hellenized city now there's Roman influences in Iconium by, by this time. But they, they, they really, they got the Greek thing going. And so when he preaches to the Jews, and the Jews who have been looking for Messiah, they accept, that's good. But the Greeks, who thinks the Jews are a little bit odd, when they hear this, and a great number of them believe, but then there's some of the Jews who just 
The word in the text is refused. I'm not hearing that. You can almost hear the bitterness in their hearts to the text. They refuse. That snarl comes to the lip. No, I'm not listening to what you're saying about this Jesus. Paul and Barnabas, by the time they get to Iconium, they've got to be a little bit tired. They're 90 miles from where they were in the city in Antioch. They arrive here at Iconium. Um, they've crossed them into another Roman province. They're in the province of Galatia now. They followed what's known as the Sebastian Way to this ancient region. And they're on a plateau. They climb to get up there. 3,370 feet. That's a good walk. My physical therapist said, Alan, you need to be walking. Okay. What's that mean to you? My 15 minute walks didn't mean that was enough to him. Go walk for 45 minutes. So I was trotting down one of the golf courses the other day. Tour Hills Golf Course. It's a big old thing. We live on the edge of it, so we see some of it. And you start walking that path and just keep going and find out this is huge. So walking, walking on that thing. And I didn't know where I was going. And it was about 6.30, going towards 7 o'clock. And I know sooner or later it's going to get dark. <coughs> and I'm fine. I see the sun setting in the west, and I know my house is back over here. And the path is kind of going that way. And then it makes one of these turns, and I know I'm going to be going towards Knoxville. I said, this doesn't work. But I met this older couple coming up that hill right there before I escaped the golf course. And <coughs> found myself way on the backside of Sneed with a long way to back home. <laughs> this little old couple is out together. Beautiful evening for a walk, he says. I said, yeah, you sure have made it up a big hill. She couldn't talk. She just smiled. And nodded and kept going. This walk up to Iconium was no little thing. They really put themselves out to get up there. Geographically, they're up on a plateau. It's kind of like being right here, but they're in a metropolitan city. They're not in a they're not in a nice little compact town like we are. And they're seeing all these sights and all these things, and they don't have a different plan. Where's the synagogue? They get there, they preach. Paul and Barnabas are taking their lives into their own hands. When they're in the very civilized areas, the Pax Romana is evident, the Roman peace. They're keeping things peaceful at the point of execution if you don't behave. But when they get out from the from the more civilized areas where there's yes Roman control but not as much Roman enforcement, people can be stirred up. And the Jewish people, when they hear this, they can get stirred up. And they they have contacts in the cities they live in. They get the Gentiles stirred up too. So Paul and Barnabas, they're there, they're 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 teaching and preaching but what 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 we see coming right here from these jews that they refuse to believe it's it's it looks like a lynching they just they want to do this to paul and barnabas they're two brave men here's the example for us you got to be brave to be christian if you're going to be christian in the right kind of way. You have to be a brave man or woman. Because we are in a world that Satan has control over it now. And he doesn't want this message for it. He wants us to compromise ourselves, if we will. Or he wants us just to be inactive, if that's the route he can make and convince us to go. Paul and Barnabas refused that kind of thinking. They spoke out in courage. And the Jews that refused to believe, they just took us to this. What do you think Paul and Martin was telling them when they come into town? What do you think you walk into a synagogue and you got this kind of message? God 
God's been active. God has an answer for us. He comes in the form of the man Jesus Christ, who is God's son, but he is also Christ, a man who God has brought to be the Messiah. And the proofs and the miracles, other people can't do miracles like this, especially resurrection for, of the dead. They've got the message. They're teaching them. I'm convinced this little simple thing that we do, believe, repent, confess, and be baptized. I think they're teaching that. And some of them will refuse to believe because there's a divide there. Verse 3, so Paul and Barnabas spent considerable time there speaking boldly for the Lord who confirmed the message of His grace by enabling them to perform signs and wonders. I'm going to stop this class with that verse. But what I'm going to say about signs and wonders, I mean, there's different ways to define a simple word, miracle. But miracles don't happen just every day. And God needed to make his presence known. The words are coming from them. But God gives the stamp of approval, the seal of approval, by causing miracles to happen on their day. We're not giving any great description of, of what these signs and wonders include right here. But no man, no apostle could make a miracle happen without God's approval, without God's power. They didn't do these great works themselves. This is how the Lord is bearing witness to the preaching. From Paul and Barnabas as well as the twelve apostles. And so, there's a final rejection in Verse 4 through 7. We'll start that next week. The plotters plot. Mankind can plot against God, and mankind is not going to win. Men and women may suffer because of that plotting, but God wins. And so the message we see is they go and start spreading this good news all over the Mediterranean region. Is there's hope? God has a message, and as relevant as it was, as fresh as it was in that time, approximately 15 years after Jesus was on the cross, it's still that relevant today. So, we aren't in a social club here, folks. This is God's call church. We've got some work to do. And I'm so glad I get the opportunity to do it with you, Pastor. God bless you. Thank you for your attention. Hope we've gone through this together.